Um, tonight is heat stress, and the next topic will be pasture management on um, August 5th. So, um, so thank you all for hopping on tonight. Um, as we go through, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we can answer them um, at the end. Um, you can also unmute yourself at the end and feel free to ask at that time as well. Um, also on the call with us tonight is Rachel Slattery. Uh, she's in the Department of Animal Science down in, on, uh, yeah, on campus um, in College Park, as well as Amanda Grev, who's our pasture specialist. Um, her office is out at the Western Research Station. Um, and my name is Sarah Potts. Um, I'm an extension specialist with uh, University of Maryland. And my office is also out at the Western Research Station out in Keatesville. So uh, thank you all for joining in. So we have a pretty timely topic tonight. Um, if I can advance my slides, uh, which is heat stress. So very timely, uh, considering that we just had a pretty significant bout of heat stress earlier this week, uh, at least we did in our neck of the woods, and I think a lot of you all did as well. Maybe, there we go. So before we get too far into this, I just wanna go over a little bit about what stress is. Um, so there have been many different definitions of stress throughout the years. It was first defined um, in the early 1900s as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand. Um, Merriam-Webster's dictionary um, describes it as a constraining force or influence. And um, the most, one of the more recent definitions, which I really like um, because it seems a little bit more, it makes more sense to me in terms of livestock, is that it's a component of the environment that places a strain on a biological system. So uh, essentially what animals will do is they'll respond to a stress by altering either their, their behavior or their physiology in order to minimize the effect of that stressor. Um, yes. uh, in livestock production, there are several types of stresses that animals will encounter. Um, they can, you know, include things like heat stress, cold stress, um, and immune challenges, uh, poor nutri yeah. or nutritional deficiencies, social stressors. Um, so tonight, obviously, we're going to be focusing mostly on heat stress. Um, and each stressor generates an effect in the animal which generates in turn a physiological response in order to minimize the effect of that stressor on the animal. So the term heat stress describes the exact component of the environment that is affecting the biological system, i.e. the animal. So in our uh, situation here, we have heat stress, which is our stressor. The main effect is going to be to increase body temperature, which will result in increased heat loss mechanisms or heat dissipation by the animal as well as reduced heat production mechanisms in order to minimize the effect of that, of that, heat, stress, of that heat on body temperature. Uh, just to go a little bit of, not gonna go too far into, you know, this is a lot of physics talk, but we're not gonna go too far into that. Um, but heat transfer, heat will naturally transfer from warm to cool until an equilibrium is reached. In other words, that means that um, until both parties involved are the same temperature, heat will be transferred from warm to cool. This is unrealistic, obviously, for most biological systems, especially warm-blooded animals, which maintain, work to maintain a fairly constant body temperature despite external environmental temperatures. And that is a process called ther thermoregulation. So animals will expend energy in order to maintain a fairly constant internal temperature. There are four main ways that heat can be dissipated uh, by objects or animals. So the first is radiation. So that's transfer through radiant energy or infrared waves. So that's basically how the sun heats the earth. There's convection, which is transfer through air or water. Conduction, which is transfer through direct contact from one solid to another. And evaporation, which a lot of us are already kind of familiar with, uh, which is transfer through, uh, through water phase change from liquid to vapor. So, and as humans, we sweat when we get hot. So we are relying significantly on evaporation for our um, cooling to cool our bodies. Um, in terms of livestock production, we're also thinking about radiation because we're trying to, we're, a lot of times we're trying to protect the animals um, uh, from, from the heat of the sun by giving them shade and things like that. In terms of how an animal copes with heat stress, again, I mentioned earlier, the first thing that they'll do is try to dissipate heat. 
Um, so in response to stress or heat stress, they're gonna increase body temperature and this will make the animal do three different things. They'll have increased sweating. I know we don't think of cows as sweating, but they do sweat a teeny tiny bit. Um, it's not a significant way to, for them to dissipate heat, but it's one way nonetheless. Um, it will also increase their respiration rate as well as alter their behavior. Now these two are gonna be the main ways that a cow is going to dissipate excess heat. Um, increased respiration rate or panting um, relies on evaporative cooling and then altered behavioral responses will allow the animal to do different things in order to either minimize the extra heat produced as well as um, dissipate extra heat. So things like increasing water intake, seeking shade, or seeking uh, contact with cooler surfaces if available. The other thing an animal is going to do in, in addition to um, in, you know, increasing heat dissipation uh, efforts, they're also going to minimize or reduce heat production. Um, one of the major ways that ruminants will, or animals in general, re will reduce heat production is to decrease feed intake. Digestion is a process that will produce heat in any animal, but it's, uh, particularly in ruminants, um, because they have the rumen, which ferments all of those uh, forages that they eat, um, and that process does generate a significant amount of heat. So by reducing feed intake, they're reducing heat production. They're also going to decrease physical activity. Um, you know, you and I obviously don't want to go outside and run 10 miles when it's 90 degrees outside because that extra activity generates, you know, a significant portion of heat. So uh, they're going to reduce their activity level. And when we're thinking about activity level for our cattle, we're going to be, they're going to be reducing things that are associated with feed intake, grazing behavior, particularly during the heat of the day. Um, that's where they're going to really reduce their um, their feeding activity. And they're also going to reduce their reproductive activity, which is primarily important uh, for, especially for our spring calving herds, which um, oftentimes are breeding in the early to middle part of the summertime. Um, so those are ways that heat expenditure or heat production in the animal are reduced in response to heat stress. Now heat stress can have a lot of different effects on the animal. It can affect animal health. Um, it can induce dehydration. Uh, there are some studies that do show that dehydration starts to occur before um, the, uh, the behavioral signs of heat stress become apparent. Um, so that's something just to keep in mind. Um, heat, uh, dehydration does reduce production. It does reduce feed intake. Um, and in significant cases, it can reduce uh, the animal's coordination. It makes them kind of wobbly. Um, and it can also lead to, to death in severe cases. Uh, Heat stress also reduces rumination or that cud chewing behavior. That's an important behavior that's uh, really, really critical for maintaining digestive function and health. Um, the saliva produces a buffer, which helps to keep the pH of that rumen in an optimal, um, at an optimal level. So that's not a good thing. Um, and then also heat stress can induce uh, or reduce the immune response as well. So again, have, have, heat stress can have pretty significant impacts on animal health. It also has pretty significant effects on reproduction. Now, you may have heard some of these before, um, but I'm just gonna mention them again because they are very, really important um, effects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, heat stress does reduce animal activity. So that includes breeding activity of both the cows and the bulls. Um, it also reduces fertility directly on both the cow side and the bull side. In terms of the cow side, it can reduce oocyte quality or the egg quality that ovulates. It reduces fertilization rates and it can reduce embryo quality, which leads to increased pregnancy loss or reduced conception rates. Um, and some research suggests that it can take up to 40 days for uh, fertility to fully recover following a significant heat stress event. Um, for bulls, they are also affected, so don't forget about them. Um, obviously, they're not going to want to work when it's really, really hot out, but also their sperm quality and viability can be significantly reduced um, during heat stress. And it can take them six to eight, up to six to 12 weeks to recover fully from, uh, for their sperm quality to recover from heat stress. So again, don't forget about the bulls um, and heat stress does have a significant impact on reproduction. Um, there's new research out there coming uh, that's basically talking about the long-term effects of heat stress uh, that last even after the heat stress events are over. Um, this is being studied quite a bit in the dairy industry um, but there's a lot of research that's starting to show that calves that are born to cows that are heat stressed 
um, either, you know, when they're pregnant with them, have reduced performance and reduced, uh, you know, immune function. Um, heat stress also um, experienced during early calfhood can have long-term effects on, uh, on calf growth as well. Um, some of the research in the dairy industry is actually showing that uh, calves that are born to cows that are um, heat stressed during their pregnancy actually have reduced uh, milk production all the way through their third lactation. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty wild thing to imagine, really. Um, so again, this is a pretty active area of study, but and we're still learning a lot more about it. Um, in terms of the economic impact of heat stress, um, heat stress does reduce feed intake, which obviously will eventually reduce uh, daily gains. Um, in a study produced in or published in 2003, um, Norman St. Pierre estimated the economic impact of heat stress for the dairy and livestock industries to be between 1.6 and 2.3 billion dollars. Um, and in, in the cattle industry alone, the beef industry, it was around $370 million loss. And for cow-calf uh, operations nationwide, it was an $87 million loss. Now, these numbers don't account for the impacts, uh, the long-term impacts that might, might result from uh, exposure to heat stress that I mentioned earlier when they're exposed either in utero or in, or, or in early calfhood. So these numbers are probably quite uh, a bit higher than we actually think. All right. So now you know why heat stress is important. Now we're going to talk about a little bit, you know, what you can do about it and how you can recognize it. Um, no heat stress talk would be complete without the mention of something called the temperature humidity index or THI. So the idea behind the THI is to um, account for both temperature and humidity because the point at which an animal begins to feel heat stress really depends on a couple of different things. It depends on temperature humidity, as well as wind speed and solar radiation or exposure to the sun. Um, the THI attempts to account for both temperature and humidity difference, uh, uh, yeah, to account for both of those variables. Um, the THI threshold for heat stress will vary depending on an animal's physiological state. So whether, you know, level of milk production or growth rate, et cetera. Um, for beef cows, the THI cut point for them is going to be around 75. For finishing steer or heifer, it's around 72, so they're a little bit more susceptible to heat stress. And then for a lactating dairy cow, it's around 68, so they're a little bit more susceptible to heat stress than, than those former two. So this is what a THI chart looks like. Um, on the left, there's temperature, so it's kind of backwards. So you got uh, 50 degrees here all the way down up to 110 degrees here. Then you have relative humidity um, from 20% all the way to 90%. Um, and you can see um, this uh, beige or you know tannish colored line here is the uh, stress stress threshold um, after which the animals do become start to feel a little bit heat stressed. Um, the yellow is a mild heat stress, orange is moderate heat stress, and red is severe heat stress. So, on a typical Maryland day in July, let's say 87 degrees, and let's say the humidity is 60 percent your uh, THI is gonna be around 79 or 80 probably. And those animals are probably gonna be on the edge of experiencing some moderate heat stress. Um, so in Maryland on average, based on these averages here, 87, 85 and 78 degrees from July, August and September. Um, and because we're a fairly humid, humid climate here, um, a lot of our animals on average are gonna be in this mild to moderate stress um, area uh, for a good portion of the summer. And obviously there will be some days where they dip up even up to the, the severe stress as well on really hot days, such as earlier this week, for example. The important thing to remember with heat stress prevention is to be proactive. Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this case, um, because heat stress uh, mitigation becomes much more difficult once animals are already heat stressed. So you gotta cool them down and then keep them from getting hot again. It, it, it's very difficult to do after they're already um, overheated. The way to do this would be to um, first and foremost monitor weather forecasts. You want to make sure you're looking at uh, the regional heat stress forecasts. Um, the USDA, if you're not aware of it, has a tool um, that will take into account temperature, humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation to make a projection. I think they project out seven days in advance um, for how, uh, for whether or not there's going to be heat stress in, uh, for your animals. Um, and based on that, you should implement heat stress mitigation strategies before the forecasted heat wave. 
this is just a screenshot of what those tools look like. Um, if you go to, to those tools, you have the option to select either a uh, na uh, national map or a regional map. And the regional one, you can pick different regions based on where you are. Um, but the red is obviously indicating areas that there's gonna be significant heat stress. The blue is gonna be areas where there's not heat stress at all, really. Um, so this one I pulled from this past Tuesday when it was pretty warm. I kind of wish I'd pulled it from Monday um, because I think it was a bit warmer that day because it's a little more humid. Um, but you can see that on Tuesday, this was the forecast, but I, I believe it based on what we observed, that much of Maryland was in the orange or some of the some of the folks in the, on the shore were in the in the red zone. So pretty significant heat stress for our animals um, if they weren't if they didn't have access to some of these heat abatement strategies, which I'm going to talk about here shortly. Um, so you might be thinking, well, when do you start to see the effects of heat stress? You know, I, I had, you know, we had one day, you know, a couple of weeks ago that was only, that was 90 degrees and the next day it was like 80 and everything was fine. Um, well, a lot of our research is showing that um, heat stress generally, the effects of heat stress generally start to occur within 24 to 48 hours. So you, if you just have one day of really hot weather, um, a lot of times you won't see a significant impact on production. It's when you have several days in a row that you start to see that, that negative impact. Um, and in particular, what you'll see is those animals will start to reduce their feed intake within uh, a day or two of that heat stress. And then that will um, generally precede the reduction in growth. Um, there are a couple different heat stress risk, risk factors for our animals. Um, in terms of genetics, animals that are of European breed descent, so that's the majority of cattle found in North America, um, Angus, Charlet, Hereford, et cetera, they're going to be more predisposed to heat stress than, say, a Brahma, right? Um, there's also uh, the hide color, so dark, dark or uh, black hided animals are more susceptible to heat stress, um, as are animals that have high strung temperaments. Um, in terms of health, animals that are in poor health are oftentimes more at risk for heat stress, as are animals that have had a past case of pneumonia. Those animals oftentimes will have scar tissue in their lungs and they're not able to effectively dissipate heat through panting um, because of that scar tissue. Uh, previous health issues as well as presence of other stressors can also uh, predispose animals to heat stress. Production level, I already mentioned that, so if they're uh, milking really well or if they're, they have a if they're growing really, really well, um, those animals are going to be more at risk as well. Previous exposure to high temperatures um, also has factors into whether or not animals will have a high a heat stress susceptibility. So if you get a really warm day in the beginning of the spring, um, a lot of times that will hit them harder than, say, a really warm day at the end of August because they haven't really been exposed to that heat earlier on. Um, this goes also goes uh, for animals that are being purchased from cooler regions and coming to a you know, more southern or a more warmer climate, um, a lot of times those cattle will have um, be more susceptible to heat stress as well. And then the environment. So I already kind of alluded to sudden temperature increases. Um, if the overnight low temperatures do not go below 70, 70 degrees, a lot of times um, that can be problematic for um, animals because they rely on that nighttime, those low temperatures at nighttime to really cool themselves down. Um, from the from all that extra heat they absorb during the day. If the THI is above 80 for more than two consecutive days. Um, and then also if the weather is, you know, sunny, blue skies, no cloud cover, a little air movement, and if it's really humid, um, those are all risk factors for heat stress. Um, in terms of preventing heat stress, I thought we should first go over how we should recognize heat stress so you know, if you know your animals are heat stressed or not. Uh, the most accurate assessment would be to measure body temperature directly because that is the major effect of um, heat stress on an animal. However, we don't advise you to do this. Um, one, it's not practical, but also working the animals to get the temperature, uh, the rectal temperature from them would be, um, would increase their, their stress level and make them more heat stressed. Um, so the simplest assessment involves measuring the respiration rate of the cattle. Um, the respiration rate reacts pretty quickly to changes in weather, so that's a pretty reliable way to um, assess uh, heat stress level in your cattle. It's pretty easy to measure. To measure. You, don't require, you don't need to restrain them and you don't need special equipment. 
basically all you're going to do is watch the flanks on the animal and go, uh, go in and out. That's one, one breath uh, for 15 seconds and multiply by four. Um, anything less than 60 breaths per minute is normal. 60 to 99 breaths per minute is uh, alert or mild heat stress. 100 to 120 breaths per minute is danger or moderate heat stress. And then over 120 breaths per minute is emergency or um, very high heat stress. Um, in addition to looking at respiration rate, there's also a six stage heat stress guide uh, that the USDA um, Meat Animal Research Center produced. Um, and the stages are based on four different areas of the animal. So respiration rate, mouth appearance, orientation, as well as social behaviors. For respiration, you have either elevated or labored. Um, elevated is going to be respiration greater than 60 breaths per minute. Um, and then labored breathing would be an animal that's using considerable force to breathe. So they're pushing really hard from their flanks to breathe. Um, this animal here in this video is just, um, he just has an elevated respiration rate. He's panting, he's a little hot, um, but nothing too terrible. Uh, mouth, mouth appearance um, is the next category and there are four different uh, descriptors for that. Um, there's drool, so you can see this uh, cow here has some drool coming out. Um, she's not chewing her cud, there's just some streams of drool coming. Uh, foam, which looks like this, sometimes you'll see that. Um, open mouth, Let's see if this will work. Uh, this cow is breathing and panting with her mouth open. Um, and then also tongue out. So this cow is uh, panting with her mouth open, but you can see her tongue's hanging out too. So uh, again, the four different ways or four different, uh, um, you know, uh, things to look for in, in terms of mouth appearance. Orientation, there's standing, lying, or head down. We're pretty familiar with standing and lying, but this head down posture um, is typically displayed in animals that are really heat stressed. A lot of times it's accompanied by this open mouth breathing, but they have got their head down um, and they're not really super alert. Social behavior is the last one. There's three different uh, sections for this. There's restless, so they're, he's standing up, lying down, just kind of changing position often. Bunching is another behavior that heat stressed cattle will exhibit sometimes. We a lot of times associate this behavior with uh, fly, uh, flies um, and having issues with those, um, but it's also an issue uh, with heat stress. And then in, in the advanced stages of heat stress, sometimes animals will uh, attempt to seek isolation. So this is our um, heat stress chart, um, stage one through six, stage one being pretty mild, stage six being very severe. Um, in most cases, um, you know, on a hot day, most of your animals are probably going to be between a one and a three. Um, you know, nothing too crazy. Um, you might see a couple that are in a four or five, um, hopefully never anybody in a six, um, but you really don't wanna see a, a large portion of your animals at a, five, at a four or five. If you do, that's, that's a little bit problematic, but a one, two or three, um, you know, we don't wanna see those, but a lot of times that, that's how it goes. Um, so this is an example of a cow. Um, so she's standing up, she's panting a little bit. She's got a little bit of drool going on, um, but nothing else crazy. Her mouth's not open. Um, you know, her head's fairly up. She's pretty alert. Um, she's not isolated from her herd mates. So I would call her a stage two. Um, and that's a pretty common thing to see on a hot day. Um, this animal um, is, you know, breathing with her mouth open. She's got her tongue out. She's got drool going on. Um, she, I would call around a, a stage five. Um, she wasn't, I know it's not a video, but she wasn't breathing so heavily that she was, you know, pushing. It wasn't a labored breathing. Um, and she also wasn't isolated from her herd mate. So she definitely wasn't a stage six, um, but easily a stage five. We really don't want to see a lot of this, right? So there are a couple ways to minimize heat stress. Um, and we'll go over each of these um, a little bit more in depth um, here in the next couple of slides. The first and most important thing um, that you can do to minimize heat stress is to provide water. Um, cattle will increase their water intake during hot weather by as much as 50 to 100% depending on their physiological state. Um, and that extra water is really important for um, supporting that evaporative cooling or that panting because they're losing water, they need to replenish that. Um, 
And so it's a really good idea to allow unrestricted access to clean water. So um, clean water is important because obviously if it's full of dirt or manure, they're not really gonna wanna drink it. Um, and you wanna make sure you're providing adequate water trough space. Um, the rule of thumb is at least three inches of water space per animal. So if you had 30 cows, you would need around 90 inches of water perimeter to support those 30 cows, um, give or take a little. And that's because a lot of animals will, when they come up to drink, you'll notice most of them will come up to drink together. You generally don't have, you know, one, sometimes you do, but a lot of times they go in groups, right? Um, and another tidbit, which a lot of us can't probably implement too well because we're on pasture, um, but maintaining water temperatures below 80 degrees Fahrenheit has been shown to increase water intake and help, you know, uh, help increase that heat dissipation. So something to consider. Um, and the last thing is with water, we wanna make sure that we're ensuring sufficient water trough refill capacity. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times animals will all come up in groups to drink and we wanna make sure the trough isn't getting, you know, running dry. Um, and that the water filling capacity isn't going to be insufficient to support those animals. Um, and this chart is just showing how much um, different kinds of animals will need, uh, how much water they'll need uh, based on temperature. So if it goes from 70 to 90 degrees, a growing calf that's 40, 400 pounds is gonna go from around six gallons per day to around nine and a half gallons per day. Um, there's a whole big chart in the, in the beef cattle NRC that does show this at different, you know, how you know, different weights of animals and, and how their water intake will change over different temperatures. Um, but this is just to give you a little bit of a snapshot, a little bit of an understanding of how much these animals need to drink and how much it does actually increase at different temperatures. Uh, the second important thing that you can do to minimize heat stress is to allow access to shade. So cattle will naturally seek shade during hot weather. Um, and they, if they have access to shade, they will have generally a lower respiration rate, lower body temperature, and have less panting behavior than animals that do have don't have access to shade. Excuse me. Um, and then shaded cattle generally will have better gains and spend more time grazing, and they'll oftentimes consume less water because they're less heat stressed. Um, this figure does a pretty good job of kind of summarizing um, the difference between animals when they're shaded versus not. When they're not shaded, heat uh, the heat will um, uh, increase the core temperature of the cattle, which will reduce immune function, um, which will increase their stress level and frustration um, and alter their behavioral patterns. So they'll, um, you know, they, they might exhibit bunching. They might do, a, a, you know, a handful of other things. Um, whereas when they're shaded, um, they are not going to be increasing their body temperature quite as much. They might still a little bit, but um, they have a little bit of protection here with the shade. Um, they're not going to be as immune suppressed and they're not going to be as stressed. And a lot of times they're going to be more able to maintain uh, fairly normal behaviors uh, when they do have access to shade. Um, ideally, we want at least tw uh, 20 to 40 square feet of shade per animal. And we need to think about um, the orientation of the shade structure or, you know, the tree or whatever you're, we're talking about as the sun moves because the size of the shade as well as where it is on the field um, does change uh, depending on, you know, its orientation is and, and when the sun moves. So we have man-made stru uh, shade structures, which can include permanent uh, structures, barns, lean-tos, shade cloths, things like that. Um, you can also get creative um, and, and create a portable shade structure that you can move around the pasture or what have you. Um, but whatever structure it is, we want to make sure that it's at least eight feet tall to allow enough airflow to go through there. A natural shade is another great option. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have pastures with lots of natural shade, um, go you. Um, but uh, so trees are wonderful shade structures. It's just really important that if you only have a couple in a pasture to make sure that they're not um, getting, the, the, the field around them is not getting too, too roughed up. Um, you know, there's this situation here where there's only one tree in the pasture and everybody's crowded around it. That's okay when it's really, really hot out, but during times when it's not so hot out, we might wanna consider you know, keeping them away from that tree because that damage will eventually, um, can eventually damage the tree as well. And then you might not have any trees. Um, and we certainly don't want that. Um, it's important again to plan ahead. Um, if you have trees surrounding one of our pastures, um, you could set the paddock 
the fence lines perpendicular to the tree line to increase the efficiency of shade utilization here. So they have shade in every paddock um, versus this type of setup where they don't necessarily have shade in every paddock unless you allow them access back here when it's really hot. Um, and this example, um, and obviously you're gonna be limited sometimes depending on where your water is and what have you. Um, if you have a situation where um, you just wanna allow them you know, access to the shaded area for a portion of the day, that's fine. The heat of the day is generally from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then after that, either um, let them you know, into the next paddock or put them in a different pasture, uh, that's fine too. Um, obviously there, there are many ways to address this issue, but um, these are just a couple of suggestions or things to think about. Um, being creative, um, I've seen a lot of creative ideas. So um, anyways, it's good, to, it's good to, to think outside the box sometimes in, in regards to shade. Um, the next thing is planning handling events appropriately. So we wanna make sure we're working cattle um, or not working cattle, excuse me, um, or transporting them unless it's absolutely necessary during a heat wave. I really, really don't wanna do this um, because that does increase their activity level. If you're transporting and removing them, you're also increasing their stress level um, because you know, you're moving them and working with them. Um, if it's unavoidable, it's really important to do it early in the morning um, and make sure that each animal is not being worked or you know, contained for more than 30 minutes at a time. So if you have a really big group of cattle that you can't get through in 30 minutes, um, split the group in half if you can. Um, it's, the reason why we say early morning working is better than evening. Um, that's because cattle will still be heat stressed um, during the evening hours um, because they are, they're still trying to dissipate that extra heat they've accumulated throughout the day. Uh, whereas in the morning, they've had all night to do that. Um, and as always, we wanna make sure that we're ensuring a calm and safe experience for the cattle, um, getting them overly excited or overly worked up. Obviously, we'll, we'll increase their, um, their heat production from their body, so which will also increase their, their, um, their heat stress level. And then if you have handling facilities um, that you're using, um, consider the shade availability, or at least the shade, um, shade for the part where the cattle are going to be, to be held before you, you run them through the alley. Another strategy to help mitigate heat stress is to control flies. Um, you might be like, what? Um, well, that's because flies a lot of times will cause cattle to bunch, which is an avoidance behavior. Um, if, you, uh, if cattle are bunched together, they don't have a really good ability to dissipate that extra heat. Think about, you know, you're in a room with all these, all these people and it's 90 degrees, you really wanna get away from them. Um, flies that affect animals on pasture include the horn fly and the face fly. Those are our predominant pests. Um, but if you implement, you know, good fly control measures um, that can help minimize that bunching behavior. So using our, your, you know, your rubs, your dust bags, um, particularly in forced use areas where they have to use them in order to access say mineral or water, um, that can be really effective. Fly tags can be useful as well as pour-ons or sprays. So um, again, fly management can be a tremendous help in terms of helping to mitigate that heat stress. Um, Again, planning ahead is key. We wanna make sure that we are um, avoiding other stressful procedures during a heat wave. So if you're checking your heat stress forecast and you see that there's you know, a heat wave coming on, uh, don't plan for your vet to come out and castrate your calves or vaccinate them or wean your calves during that time or even a couple of days beforehand because we wanna make sure that they're not having extra stress during those uh, those those hot days. So um, delay those procedures if if you can. Um, another one is supplemental airflow, which is generally really going to be mostly a, applicable to folks that are going to be confining their animals in some way, shape, or form. Um, whether that's to provide shade or you know to provide shade, or if that's you know just how your system is run, uh, we want to make sure that there's good airflow going through the barn. Um, if you want to, you can put a fan in there. If you have electricity. Um, but you don't have to. We just want to make sure that there's at least some good airflow coming through. Um, paddock selection um, can be helpful when, when you're thinking about airflow uh, because some paddocks do receive a better cross breeze than others depending on how they're oriented and depending on whether or not there are obstructions like hills or trees that might block airflow. And then the last thing is timing feedings. 
Again, this is really only applicable if you're providing some sort of supplemental feed to your cattle, um, like silage or grain. Um, cattle are less likely to eat during the heat of the day. Um, and and because, again, as I mentioned earlier, they're trying to dis, you know, reduce the amount of heat they're producing. So they're not gonna be eating, um, and, and which, you know, because digestion does produce, produce heat. So um, a lot of times they're gonna wanna eat in the evenings. Um, so a lot of times it's a really good idea to provide feedings um, or access to new pastures in the evening so the animals can eat when it is cooler outside. So what do you do if your animals are already heat stressed? Uh, well, the important thing is that you should not work them to get them to a cooler location. Um, and basically that kind of reiterates the idea that we don't wanna be working them when it's really hot out. Um, we, that obviously increases their activity load which could make heat stress worse. Uh, what you wanna do is watch them closely um, if possible, move shade or water to them if you can. Um, and then, uh, you know, wet, you could consider wetting them uh, with water, uh, but that's really, it's really important to be careful with that because if they're not used to that, they might get up and run away, which again, could make it worse. Um, so again, just observing them and then trying to be pro more proactive next time is your best bet. Um, so the take home messages for heat stress in cattle is to be proactive. Uh, we want to make sure we're being proactive about stress prevention, um, you know, taking measures to mitigate heat stress before the heat stress event starts. Um, we want to make sure we're looking at our heat stress forecast um, during the summer months and move animals to favorable, envir favorable environments at the beginning of a heat stress or before the beginning of, of a heat stress event. Um, we want to make sure we're providing ample access to fresh, clean water and provide access to shade, at least during the hottest parts of the day, if you can. Um, don't work cattle during, um, during times when it's really hot and they're prone to heat stress. And then also monitor your animals fairly closely on particularly hot days to make sure that everyone's doing okay. Um, with that, we'll take any questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will answer them.